Hi, it's Gareth from Rockfiend, and joining me from across the ocean in Los Angeles, I believe, is Kane Roberts. Good evening, Kane, or good morning to you. Oh, good morning, Gareth. I, uh, I was very nice to speak with you. Oh, it's not my voice. No, but uh, it's very, it's very nice to speak with you. Yeah, I, uh, uh, it's pretty early here. I think it's uh, eleven in the morning, California time. Our weather has been just, you know. 70s 80s sunny you know so it's it's kind of beautiful california weather so it's kind of nice that's that's tropical weather in scotland we would call that a heat wave over here <laughs> yeah yeah well you know when when i was in scotland um i remember it was kind of kind of rainy kind of drizzly uh weather and uh, i you know i remember being in the hotel we were in was 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 very old. Uh, this is when I was touring with um, with Alice Cooper back in the day, and I remember um, going down to the lobby. I think it was four in the morning, and I saw uh, Alice there. He's in the lobby. He's awake, and it, it's maybe you know forty degrees. It's kind of rainy. It's dark, and he's got his golf clubs, and and I said, dude, where are you going? And he goes, this is where golf was invented. He said, I'm going to go golfing. He, he left. I mean, it was really cold and kind of rainy out, and he still went golfing. So uh, uh, that, was, that was one of the things I noticed about him. And the other thing I remember about Edinburgh, other than the fans, were some of the most sincere, passionate fans with music I've ever come across. You know, I got the feeling, you know, in the United States, in, in those days, everything was MTV. Yep. And so you get a certain feel from the fans from in 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 Scotland. I got the feel that that people just it was mostly word of mouth and just, you know, what they believed in in magazines and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, uh, I, we just had we had a great time there. And then I remember for dinner, I decided to go out and get something to eat. And I had one of the best bowls of spaghetti in my whole life in, in Edinburgh, Scotland. I always tell people that so. Well, there's a lot of Italians over in Scotland, so that doesn't surprise me, actually. <laughs> okay, that's what it was, yeah. So are you, um, are you still in, in quarantine over in California, or are things coming back to normal? Well, it keeps going uh, back and forth. In other words, they'll say, okay, you can go in the restaurants. And everybody goes in the restaurants, and then they go, yeah, you better not go in the restaurants. So he goes, <laughs> okay. You know, for me, um, you know, they said uh, you can't, you can't if you, if you have to go to an office or go somewhere to work, um, you know, you can't do that anymore. Well, you know, I do a lot of different things and I work everything out of my house with my computer set up or whatever it is, my studio. And then they said, you can't go to the gym. Well, I have a ho home gym. And then finally, they said, we don't want you to go out and hang out with other people. And I haven't done that in 20 years. So I was fine. So, you know, everything was, is kind of cool here, but it's going it's going back and forth. It's one of those things where uh, uh, nobody really knows what to do because, um, you know, in America, we have something called flu season. So, in, you know, in the winter and fall is flu season. People get sick. Well, yep. this doesn't have a season. I mean, it's been going now since from winter and now we're heading into summer and people are still getting it. So it's, it's, a, little, it's a little different. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly been a very different times for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you know, people, some people are all, they, they get all upset about masks and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I just, I, I do whatever they say to it, to a certain degree. I'm not an obeyer. I don't like to obey, you know, rules and stuff like that. But, you know, some people get upset if you don't have a, uh, a mask on and, you know, um, uh, geez, there's a story I could tell you, but I better not tell you that one. But, but, uh, but, you know, uh, 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 but, but for me, it's like, you know, I don't want people to get all upset or whatever. So I, I just kind of, you know, cooperate on this a little bit. So it's fine. Yeah, I think it's it's the way to be. But however, um, the whole point of this interview, the, the reason that I came to be in contact with you was uh, maybe about two months ago, I was uh, out a run. I was trying to move some of that COVID quarantine weight that I'd put on. <laughs> I was out a yeah. run. Um, in the Scottish countryside, and I usually always go out running with my headphones on. And one day I was just looking for something very different to listen to, something I maybe hadn't heard for a while. And I thought, I'm going to listen to Kane Roberts' The Saints and Sinners album. And I went to get it on, and when I looked at that, I noticed, ah, oh, wait a minute, Kane's got a new album out. And it's an album that I had absolutely no idea that you'd released around about, actually about a year and a half ago now, in early 2019. 
and that's yeah. called New Normal. Now, I'm sorry, I have no idea how I missed that album, Ken. Been a fan for years. I don't know how I missed that. How did that happen? Well, you can ask the record company, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I it's 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 one of those things. By the way, um, I made the record for Frontiers Records, and they're they're the the owners of that company, uh, uh, Serafino and Mario, um, are awesome. They're really they're really great uh, believers, and and that's how they started out of an apartment, and and it's grown into something, you know, really good and everything. And they have a very specific business model. So, you know, in terms of how much uh, your record gets promoted, it's pretty much standard for them. They have these sort of uh, default things that they do or whatever. But, um, you know, they, they gave me the opportunity. It took me three years to record the record, and they were very patient. I mean, not that it also probably meant that the record wasn't that important to them. But I think, I think you know, the fact that they were that patient uh, just shows that, you know, there's some special people over there. I, you know, I don't really mean to complain about the record company, but it's difficult these days, you know, to, yeah. to get the word out because there's there's very little support. And, you know, I hadn't I hadn't I'd been off the grid for, you know, years, you know. So what happened to me was I, I went into the studio. I started to record um, some stuff. Uh, my friend Kip Winger uh, sent it over to um, Serafino and. You know, he's very skeptical. I don't even think he wanted to do the record, but, you know, he, he sort of agreed to it. And they, they'll be going. We started. As it turns out, you know, I, I found out that the guy is very, very smart and very on point with music and stuff like that. I don't think they like me right now. You know, they, they I think my last emails uh, from them were like, hey, fuck you. But I, I thought, I, you know, I, my feeling on those guys is uh, one of the best record companies I've ever been with. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy. with. This. I'm not on the label anymore. So it, it's not like I'm trying to, you know, kiss their ass for any reason. <laughs> but but I'm just saying uh, that is, was my overall impressions, you know, um, uh, of them. So anyway, I, I go in the studio and then, of course, you know, I, there was a little bit of a sort of a discovery uh, timeline to it because I was going, geez, I, you know, haven't been in front of a mic like this, a microphone. I wonder if I can sing, you know, and my voice started to really come back. I was very surprised. My range was still there and all that stuff. You know, I had been singing, but, you know, this is like the show. This is this is reality. You know, I had to step back into the jet stream and try to get something out there that I thought, you know, people would would understand and, and would like, you know, and that that was the same with with every aspect of it, the writing, the guitar and everything. So, you know, we almost made an album and then threw it away and then came back. And, uh, you know, I, I was able to write with uh, Brent Smith from uh, Shinedown and Lizzie Hale and, you know, just a massive talents. So I was very lucky. And then, as you know, I got Alice and Alyssa White Glues from uh, Arch Enemy to join in on one song. And uh, actually, um, Hideki from uh, from uh, uh, Baby Metal. Yep. So, you know, as the thing evolved, you know, we became very happy. And, and I sort of decided with my co-producer to... to you know, get it, give it kind of a, a cinematic approach. So you'll see, you know, a lot of the songs will start with this sort of atmospheric kind of a, uh, uh, an approach, and then it gets into sort of like the hard, heavy, or whatever it is that I'm trying to do after that. So I'm really glad, uh, you know, you took a listen. I'm glad you got a, a shot at it. Yeah, it, it was a great lesson. It genuinely was a great lesson. And as soon as I got home, I'd actually put a post on, I think it was Instagram, that you replied to. And that's how, as I say, I came to being contact me with regarding that so no it's it's a really good album and but on that note i mean three years in the making you've already mentioned you had guests on it including uh, alice cooper himself Alyssa white gloves of arch enemy there's nisa strauss alice current guitarist uh, kip winger of course you've mentioned writing with lizzie hale so i think it's fair to say that this was more than just another album to you it, it it's a really modern rock you know really modern rock sound to it you're not really focusing in past glories so is that what you were trying to do, to move forward with the music as opposed to trying to just put out something that, that we've all heard before? Well, um, you know, that, that's that's actually a, an interesting question because anytime you you connect a company with some sort of artistic uh, 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 endeavor or some, some project, a, a creative project, you have to realize you're, you're trying to give the record company something that they know how to promote so you know you get all these voices in your ear like what is it going to be what are your fans going to look for and what are they and and what what 
I decided to do was realize that, you know, if you listen to the songs, everything I did in the past is still in there. In, mm -hmm. in other words, um, even though I wasn't performing and recording and showing you sort of the evolution of, of who I am as an artist, I was always playing guitar and I was writing and I was singing, you know, not in front of uh, crowds or whatever, but, but the thing, uh, the, the thing of it is that, that me as a creative artist, I kept moving forward. So I decided to just be true to that. In other words, if I said, okay, well, I'm going to make this kind of a record that sounds a lot more like melodic rock or eighties or heavy metal or, or any one of my albums, I'm going to make this sound like, you know, saints and sinners too, or whatever. It, it would almost seems like a little bit disingenuous or dis dishonest. In other words, you know, I, I took the shot at it. I recorded it and fans, you know, listened to it. If they went in there looking for something else, they might have been disappointed. Maybe they had, you know, found some things that they liked or whatever. But um, but yeah, yeah, it, it was one of those things where instead of making a record that I thought people would like, I made a record that, you know, I knew that I loved and whoever listened to it was getting, you know, a pretty good dose of, of truth in terms yeah. of like who, who I am and what I'm doing right now. So you know, um, you know, there, there isn't a song on it that, that I didn't really put my heart and soul into it and listen to and just say, OK, I think we've I think we've hit something here and, and we're, we're going to move forward. So, yeah, I mean, if you listen to it, I think you will see like some of the cinematic things that we're trying to do. And and uh, uh, and I think a lot of it uh, I think a lot of it worked out really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we did make the video, We you know, when I was recording beginning of the end. Um, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned this before, so I'll, I'll make it I'll make it brief. But, you know, uh, I sang the whole song myself mm -hmm. and I was going I was going, hey, uh, I'm pretty good. No, no, I, I wasn't doing that. No, but I was saying <laughs> I, I thought to myself, you know, this verse, this first verse, could you imagine Alice Cooper's voice here? And the co-producer said, oh, dude, that would be insane, you know, and I, and I he, he said, there's no way you could you could just call him up and he'd do it. Is there? And I said, well, I can call him up, you know, because Alice and I are still friends. I said, but who knows? He may be he may be on tour. He could be out of the country or whatever. So I called Alice and believe it or not, he said, yeah, he said, I'm in town. I'll be right over. <laughs> it was that it was that easy. So he came over and after, you know, he uh, made fun of me and uh, we laughed and stuff for an hour. He went in and just he sang pretty much in, in one or two takes the vocal that you hear on the uh, on the record. And, and it's and, and it's pretty it's pretty insane just how much of uh, a uh, performer he is. In other words, you give him something. He gets pushed on stage and he kills it every time. And that's that just shows, you know, so many uh, levels of genius through experience and just sort of his innate uh, skills and talent and everything. So uh, when it came time for me to, to record my uh, solo. Yeah, right before I went in to do the solo, I thought, you know what, you know, rather than doing the expected here. Could you imagine if Alyssa White Glues falls out from the ceiling and lands in the middle of the song and just detonates the whole thing, just blows yep. it up completely? <laughs> and so uh, so I didn't know her, you know, so I had somebody that knew her reach out to her. And, you know, we started uh, I presented some songs that I thought, you know, because I know she has a solo record coming out and I'm sure it's going to be stunning but um i i sent her uh I, she said well let me and i said would you ever want to sing on one of my songs and she said well i have to hear it first so i sent it to her literally within an hour she wrote back you know i'll do it just get me the track <laughs> so she she went on tour for a year and fortunately i was in this three-year project i mean if it was any other situation, I never would have gotten her vocals on it because, you know, the record company was said, we can't wait. So um, after a year, she sat down with it and sent me what you hear. In other words, we didn't change one thing. Her, you know, her clean vocals, which are completely mind blowing. And of course, her growl stuff, which added a theater and drama to the song that that just it's just so perfect. It just lifts everything into into a. a a different um, dimension. So I, you know, I'm thinking, geez, I'm so incredibly lucky. And then the only, my last thought was I wanted the baby metals dr drummer Hideki to, um, 
to play on it because he's got this he's he's just overloaded with skills and he's got this machine like sense of time and attack and approach. So um, he agreed to do it. And, you know, he's one of the most humble, beautiful people I, I've ever met. He, he wrote me and he said, I hope this is OK. And if you listen to the <laughs> drums on it, they're absolutely incredible. He's not he's not showing off. He's just part of the composition. He's part of the song. It's just really, really amazing performance. So, you know, the last bit of the story here, so it doesn't get, you know, too boring and people's heads don't fall off. <laughs> I, 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 my last thought is I'm going to shoot a video. And, and I can't shoot a video without Alice and Alyssa on the video. So I find out that Alice is playing in Vancouver. And I have a friend up there who does special effects for, you know, Born Identity and Batman and all these major films. Mm -hmm. And I said, dude, would you want to, would you want to, you know, help get this video done? He went, shit, yeah. He's like a total, he's, he's actually has an Alice tribute band, believe it or not. <laughs> so he said, yeah. So I asked Alyssa and Alyssa hit me with a line that just floored me. She said, wherever you and Alice shoot, I will be there. And she flew from Europe to Montreal, stayed at the airport for four hours, and then flew six hours to uh, Vancouver and shot the video. Just just absolutely incredible human being. Who's, who, you know, and the reason she did that is, in, in, which I've learned over the, um, over the years of knowing her, is her commitment to art. She, she is one of the most committed artists that I've ever um, and I don't mean she should be committed to an insane asylum. I mean, she's just she's just absolutely creative, skilled, bright, intelligent. And she believes in the process. And and uh, yeah, for her, it just, you know, just seemed like a no brainer. Plus, I got to meet uh, one of my new bro uh, best friends, and that's uh, that's uh, Doyle. So he and I really hit it up. He's a good friend of mine. And he's one of the funniest, most talented guys walking around from uh, the, the misfits. So, so, you know, it turned out to be an all positive, uh, experience. And then, you know, we got the video out and, you know, it's still climbing up. I think we're over 300,000 now. So, uh, you know, I expected it to do a lot better, but, you know, like I said, we don't, we didn't have the promotion. I don't think that, that, you know, was necessary, uh, to get the word out properly, uh, on the video as well. Now I am doing a director's cut. So I have a team of editors and stuff coming in, and the video looks absolutely stunning. So we're going to have that out uh, in July, and so okay. so that should be great. Well, it's funny. I was actually going to ask you about the, the video a bit later. I'm going to just go jump to that now, actually, now that we're talking about it. But the, the, the beginning of the end video, which I've, I've watched a few times now, it's more of a story than just a performance video. It, it is, it's almost like a mini movie in some ways. Now, my understanding is that, that you've done some work in the film industry before. You've just mentioned there the friends you have in the film industry. So did you take a lot to do with the production of the video in terms of the story or how it was going to go? Yeah. Now, now just, just so everybody knows, when, when, you, when you work on film or if you work on a video, you walk in there thinking, OK, I'm going to make The Matrix, right? And mm -hmm. then you, you end up making some sort of like weird little cartoon. In other words... You know, the the amount of things that happen to you in in the course of a video or film production uh, is is incredible. There's so many fires and explosions going off and things that it's oh geez, we're going to have to quit. We're going to this and that. Uh, this piece of equipment didn't show up. And, you know, it, it's just it's chaos. So we were going to go and shoot for three days, elicit, you know, agreed to stay for three days to shoot. But. Um, you know, things kind of went wrong in terms of our location and all that stuff. So we only got to shoot one day uh, total. So and, and I had, believe it or not, I had a uh, my gun guitar was uh, being sent uh, from the from the U.S. to Vancouver. And it got stopped in customs because it looked like a weapon, believe it or not. <laughs> so I was never I was never able to shoot the end, which was, you know, for the solo at the end, because I ended up putting the guitar solo at the end, uh, you know, after, you know, Alice says, go find a war. Mm -hmm. And um, I was going to dig it out from this, you know, old case, you know, this was almost like an army case that was old under the dirt and everything. I was going to open it up, pull it up. And then 
the the special effects guy had it rigged to shoot flame literally 40 feet and he he, he said he said to me when because he showed me the rig and demonstrated it and he said look when i tell you to stop pulling the trigger you have to stop he said because if it starts to feel warm you're already burned so you know i was like okay you know so but the guitar never made it to the shoot so i wasn't able to do it and and so i had to come up with a different ending so you know we sort of did that through the whole production and yes my initial decision was i don't want to make believe that there's a band there playing and doing the song which which is what everybody does which is fine you yeah. know like like it, 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 i think it looks great but i just wanted to do something different so you know we shot it more like a film uh you know in terms of uh and we didn't have you know uh, the 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 time or the budget to to make it like sort of a, a real sort of allegory so the story story goes from begin to, beginning beginning to the end so uh so you know we ended up with what we have which i still think looks really good it's really engaging it's really different and of course alice and Alyssa are amazing in it and and uh but you know the director's cut you know people will see a massive upgrade in it and you know i'm just doing it just as a creative project but yes mm -hmm we decided to do a more cinematic approach with it as opposed to like your standard performance video. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be out in July, did you say? And that'll come out in July. So, so, you know, I'll, I'll try to, you know, get, uh, maybe I'll, I'll give you a, 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 a preview of it. I'll send you a, a link and you can tell me, uh, you know, what you think of it. Oh, wow. Well, that, that would be great. That would be absolutely brilliant. Awesome. Yep. So just to, to go back to the album again, Kane, it's 10 tracks long. As I've already mentioned, it, it's modern rock. And there's a word that I've written in my notes here, and you have actually used that word already when we were talking about the album. I've described it here as being kind of panoramic and cinematic, and cinematic's the very word that you used. So w was that a deliberate choice during production to get that kind of wide panoramic cinematic sound to it? Yeah, we, we, we wanted to... Uh... We, we wanted every song, every part that goes to every song, you know, it, it builds atmosphere in the beginning. And then where people would expect, for example, there's a song called Who We Are. Mm -hmm. And it's about, you know, how people search for the right moments in time to have relationships. And, you know, when, you know, all the passion is there at the beginning, you know, it's like a lot of guys will say, you know, you know, it's. After the first year, you know, I didn't feel like having sex with my girlfriend any, anymore. You know, all the lust begins to fade. That happens a lot. And, and you know, sometimes it's the same thing with, with our, our feelings. You know, it's, it's uh, the women don't feel like having sex with the guys after a while. Or, you know, they fall out of love. Or, you know, so the moment that you realize that things might be going left or right, or, you know, it's very confusing in terms of how your relationship's going to go um that's why we came up with this song you know who we are and instead of doing a guitar solo in the middle i i found this uh, really great artist that i'm currently producing her name's uh you know kat frenich and she sings the middle section and it's the girl's voice in the song and that plays out a little bit more cinematic or like a play or like a musical as opposed to you know, the standard, um, you know, sort of rock map that people follow when they're writing songs, you know, and, and, you know, Gareth, a lot of this stuff is risky because, you know, if you keep throwing people curveballs, you know, they, they're, they, they almost get uneasy and they don't want to continue with it Does that, because, you know, we're sort of brought up with, with certain patterns that we feel comfortable with, we feel better about. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I think the rock audience, is a very intelligent audience and they know what they like. So, you know, we still, we, we, we went ahead, even though some of it's, you know, a little bit, bit risky in terms of our approach, we thought we wanted to make the, the music as engaging as, as possible. So we layered this kind of cinematic um, feel to it. There's a song called Above and Beyond. And if you'll notice the intro, the intro doesn't sound like the first chorus. In other words, the band is now in and everybody's hitting it really hard. And and uh, but the opening has, you know, these kind of keyboard sounds and these mechanical sounds that we put together. So. Uh, so, yeah, that was very that was very intentional. And, you know, the effort is to set it apart from other records and just do what we believe in. Mm -hmm. 
No, but it, you've, certain, you're saying it was a risk. Well, I can tell you, having listened to it several times, it's a risk that, in my opinion, certainly paid off. It, it, it is a great, great listen, and um, it, it's been great, obviously, just talking to you about it and hearing about how you you made it. Now, looking at uh, again, Ken Mary produced. Is that right? Uh, Ken Mary, what? He produced the album or assisted with production. Is that no, right? no? I produced it with a, a guy named Alex Track. All right. And, okay. and and see, one of the great things, Garrett, is like you know, you say to yourself, okay. Wait a second. You took three years to record it. What was the recording budget? <laughs> well, Alex and I became friends and I, I, you know, I said, why don't we co-produce it? And it turned it in terms of the business model. That's what it turned out to be. Of course, you know, I paid him. But but, you know, to get the studio for three years, it took sort of like a, a sort of a special situation going on. So it was it was just a very, very deeply uh, committed, um, you know, passionate, uh, 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 creative effort sort of a thing so so we were very like you know involved in the music and it turned out to be you know and of course you know because it's a studio it reminded me of when i was a kid because you know in order to record stuff i would have to sneak into a recording studio at night they'd have to like say okay you can you can record for free if you want or just you know buy the engineer dinner mm -hmm. and you know i would sneak in and record something you know and, and of course you have to go in at night so you know we would start recording at be anywhere between 9 p.m. and midnight. And, you know, we would leave like at 2000 o'clock. You know what I mean? It would be like really late by the time we left. But um, we got it. You know, we I was able to, you know, finally pu pull it all together, you know, with all the mixing and stuff. So so so, yeah, no, no, Ken didn't produce it, although I, I know that he does produce some bands and, you know, he's very talented in that way. Yeah. So um, we've already mentioned the the guests on the album. You've already explained how you you came to, to you know get Alyssa White goes on the album, yep. uh, and it's fair to say that you know the guests on the album grow from rock royalty to more current artists. So how did you identify who you wanted for the particular songs, and uh, did you already know the tracks that you wanted each person on? Yeah, you know, it was it was a it was a moment where I would say, for example. Who can play bass on this song? That would be great. Now, of course, I'm. I'm I think Kip's got one of the the grittiest, nastiest bass sounds of anybody I've ever heard. When he wants to play like that, so any of the songs that you see he's featured on, it's because you know it's a no brainer. He played on beginning of the end, and mm -hmm. you know he had to he had to detune and you know uh, 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 he had to um, tune his his bass down and all that stuff. And you know those are all special skills. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, uh, so so at that particular so so, you know, Kip was was just sort of a no brainer that I was going to reach out and really harass him until he played stuff for free because I told him he had to play for free. And, you know, of course, he got very angry. No, no, no. He, he was happy to do it. And then, you know, I had strings on a couple of the songs. And of course, that's Kip with all of his classical sort of knowledge. He won a Grammy as a class, or he was up for a Grammy mm -hmm. for classical composer, you know, that year. So, you know, he knows what he's doing with that. Um, when it came to somebody like Nita Strauss, um, Nita's one of those players that I think uh, has a tremendously uh, uh, enthusiastic um, and, and very kind of a, a uh, a guttural, almost animal-like approach to how she plays her solos. It's it's really, it's very it's very intense. And you know, uh, so when I was doing a solo on King of the World, it's the opening song in the record. I just, you know, I, I felt, you know, could you imagine what it'll be like, you know, if she starts it, she starts the creative process, and then I have to either, you know, contrast it or just take, you know, what she played and maybe expound on it and do something a little bit more. Um, as it turns out, you know, I, I, I called her and, and she was like, she was immediate. She was like, yes, I mean, we're both, we're both very into each other's playing. I really, I, I love her playing. And she said that she really likes hearing what I do as well. And so, so, um, so yeah, so yeah, I remember, I remember, you know, I got her, she wasn't in the studio. She sent her recording in. And if you listen to her first riff that she plays, because she goes first, it fucking tears your head off. I was going to go, I thought to myself, Jesus, I better wake up when I, when I play my part, you know? So, um, and that worked out really well. Um, like I said, in the process with beginning of the end, uh, you know, Hideki, I, I just felt that his drums were perfect on it. So, you know, any of the people that you see on it, they're, they're people that I not only respect, 
but I hear they're playing on the songs and that moment didn't happen until we were kind of well into the production. In other words, we already had drums on mm -hmm. beginning of the end, but I thought it needed, you know, somebody who could link up with the feel a little better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you, so you're already looking ahead. Uh, you've basically made the song and you're looking at how you can improve it with a certain style of player. So, yes. Yeah. 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 So, so it's one. It's it's. It, in other words, uh, the delivery system of a song is as crucial as as the writing. I mean, I remember, uh, uh, you know, writing with, um, you know, Desmond Child, and he said the things you have to always ask yourself for each with each song is, would you go out and buy this? He said, I don't care what's going on with the music industry. If you hear a song. And it strikes you so much emotionally and in terms of how it impresses you as with a melody or the band's playing or the guitar playing, whatever it is that catches your fancy, would you get up, get in your car or go online and buy the song? And so, so I felt like, you know, yeah, you know, I could play all the guitar on the song and I could do all the singing and all that stuff. But, you know, when I found a moment where I thought that there was a serious upgrade because of somebody else's skills, I have no problem, uh, you know, having them, you know, asking them to, to, to play on, on whatever song. And, you know, I, and, you know, maybe it's partially because of my ability, but I was pretty lucky because not only did I get great people, but their performances really did, I think, upgrade, you know, the final product that we finally put out. So... So, yeah, you know, it, it's a really important uh, process. You have to keep your eyes open. And, you know, um, I've written uh, scripts before. There's a guy that writes, an incredible writer. He's, he was born to write. His, his name is uh, Larry Gross. He, you know, he wrote a movie from a long time ago um, with uh, 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 Nick Nolte mm -hmm. and Eddie Murphy called 48 Hours. Really oh, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And so he's written films after that that have done really well. And he said, anytime you're in the creative process, you have to keep mr mediocre away he's always like any of the musicians out there they may hear this if you're if you're writing a song or you're, you're putting a guitar solo together there might be something that you you always do and it's kind of an easy thing to do and you have to sort of reject that little guy because he's always there going hey just you know do something whatever here it'll be okay mm -hmm. and it, larry said it's never okay and mm -hmm. and so you know i've sort of that's sort of been my mantra sim since then whenever I'm, I'm doing that, when I'm home practicing scales and I'll go through some scale that I've never played before. And, you know, I keep messing it up. I, I do it until it's until well, I think, you know, at that particular moment, it's perfect. Otherwise, you know, I could just sort of say, ah, well, that's good enough. I sort of, you know, can do it. You know, those are the, the sort of, you know, moments we have to kick our own asses as much as possible. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's always giving your best always. Yeah. Because, because, you know, uh, because, you know, we walk we walk around and do stuff, you know, we might smoke weed once in a while, we're eating a sandwich, we're watching TV, we're fucking around on our phones or whatever. Those are not moments where, you know, they, they're demanding a lot from you. But when you're in the creative process, there's nothing else that you should do other than your best because mm -hmm. because uh, other and, and it's one of the beauties of, of, you know, creating or even in business, coming up with some business plan or whatever it is that we do, you know, a, a, as an interviewer or writer or, you know, whatever it is we do, you know, those are the moments, those are the opportunities where, where, where it demands that we do something special, something different. And not only is that incredibly gratifying to ourselves, but when people see it, you know, you enrich their lives, you know, 50% more than if you had just taken an easy road. So, you know, uh, it, you become part of a greater process or well, let's put it this way. You become a greater part of the process. Yeah. So to, to look, if you don't mind, if we, if we just take a, a, a few minutes to look at, at your career and basically how everything that you've done before this point led to the new normal album and led to it being as successful or certainly to me as successful as it, as it sounds. So mm. if you don't mind, could, could we just look at your, your earlier career for, for a start, and but even before entering the music business, basically, was music a big part of your life? And what would you say influenced you to become a musician and to move into the, the style and the genre of music you're known for? Yeah, well, 
I used to be a male stripper and fight. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I never did that. Okay. You know, everybody says, you know, like, like, Hey, did you ever, you know, compete as a bodybuilder? I'm like, fuck no. You know what I mean? I'm not going to put oil on my, you know, not, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I, I just, you know, it's not, it's not what I do. So, um, but, but, you know, um, as a little kid, uh, you know, I, I picked up the guitar very young. So it was one of those things where, you know, uh, my parents wanted me to do other stuff, obviously, but it kept coming around to the guitar. And, you know, uh, it's funny. I got into a university called Boston University. I was there for like 15 minutes. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't stand it. So, um, you know, my my parents are very conservative, extremely conservative, very strict in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so I said I wanted to play music. I wanted to go to music school. So there were two universities in in my in Boston, in Massachusetts, where I, I grew up. And uh, one of them was called Berkeley, which a lot of people have gone to. It's a fine school. But, you know, mm -hmm. the at that time, uh, the the admissions were very easy. And in, in other words, if I was willing to throw a check down, I could you and I if you and I were willing to pay for it right today, we could probably get in uh, as a tuba player and learn how to play tuba. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the New England Conservatory. Um, and by the way, I'm not making fun of Berkeley. It's it's a great school. But, no, no, but, no, no. but 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 New England Conservatory, the year that I got in, they accepted two guitar players. So and and my audition, so people, you know, I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Fame, but you know, the girl walks in there and she's got to dance in front of like these famous, you know, dancers and instructors and all this stuff, and and that's how you you become part of the. Uh, uh, you know, you you got into this very you know intense school. I, my, I don't know what what school it was, mm -hmm. but um, at the conservatory, you know, I put on a leotard. No, no, I'm kidding. No, I, I I went in there and there was a band there, and I had to play an original composition. Um, I had to play a song I had never heard of before, and the band keeps changing the key while I'm playing. And and in front of me are famous jazz musicians and classical composers and teachers and everything. There's a big there's like 10 of them staring at me. So, you know, I walked out of there literally dripping in sweat going, well, that was a fail. <laughs> I, didn't think, I didn't think I got in. It was, it was unbelievable. And, you know, I was very lucky. I, I did get accepted to the school. So uh, so so that was sort of the beginning of me, you know, thinking you know, OK, I can be a musician. And of course, my parents got the legitimacy of me being, you know, uh, getting into a school that's very difficult. So, you know, they ponied up and they paid for it. So, uh, you know, I was uh, you know, very, very grateful for that. Um, and then, you know, my second or third year into being at that school, which, you know, I learned an awful lot. I had a great guitar teacher and, and all that stuff. But I remember I was talking to one of the guys there and I said, you know, are you going to graduate? Like, why do people graduate from music school? And he said, well, mostly to be a teacher. And so I said, he said, he said, look, you can't go into a record company and say, I graduated from the New England Conservatory. Can I have a record deal? So I kind of quit that day and, mm -hmm. and, and I moved to New York and, uh, and I was in, you know, Manhattan, you know, pretty, pretty young. And, that's when I started getting, you know, learning about what the real music industry was like. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a famous story, but somehow, you know, Bob Ezrin got one of my tapes because I would, you know, like I said, I was sneaking in to, to, to studios and recording and trying to get my demos down. And then, you know, uh, I, I mailed them around to different places and this place called Screen Gems with this guy, Al Passione. I don't know why the, the name is important. In important but but anyway uh he was the one that sent it to bob ezrin and bob ezrin told alice about it alice came to see me play at a club in new york and completely disguised nobody knew he was there which mm -hmm. is hard to do with that face i gotta be honest <laughs> with you and and um he uh he they ended up inviting me to meet everybody at the alive enterprises office in manhattan that's chef gordon uh, his manager, who's like, you know, legendary, you know, uh, he was legendary then. But, you know, today, you know, he's just there. Uh, Mike Myers made a movie of him called Supermensch. It's one of the most incredible films. And and um, so, you know, I walk in. Uh, I go into the first office and Ezrin's there with this big desk. 
and there's this big window, picture window behind him. You can see Manhattan behind him. And, and, uh, you know, I swear to God, his seat was way higher than mine. So it was like looking at the Wizard of Oz. You know, I'm like, I'm really sitting down low looking up at him. And he goes, Kane, you are 50% of a great writing team. And I think you need to write with Alice. You know, so I was like going, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and I got to be honest with you, Gareth, I don't get nervous in those situations. I kind of go with the flow of it. Mm -hmm. So I walked into the next room and there was Alice and Shep and, you know, uh, the entourage and all these people that really had changed history. They had changed culture. They had changed music because of their, you know, being visionaries. And while we're sitting there, Alice and I became best friends. And uh, I'm not sure why but it was almost like we knew each other and that day we drove up to a studio and we started writing together and you know that that's how the uh that's how everything evolved into you know where where we are today and you know you know of course you know there's there's, there's diff different moments like in other words i thought i was an amazing incredible guitarist nobody liked me i moved to california there's so many incredible musicians around like, fuck, there's so many good guitar players. I got to practice, you know, which is a which is a good process. And then after my first tour with Alice, the upgrade in terms of your ability as just a general professional musician, of course, goes way up because Alice is is if not the is one of the best live performers you'll ever see. And And, you know, back in those days. He and I created this culture of violence on stage that was absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, he, he, you know, everybody said, oh, you know, Alice is coming back, you know, and I've, I've mentioned this before, you know, and I, I don't like to do, uh, you know, interviews and say the same thing, but I told Alice, I said, I don't want people to think that you survived rehab or that you, you've come back and you can still play the music that you did before. I think we have to come out and compete with you know the aussies and van halen and all these bands that are out there playing these arenas at this time mm -hmm. so instead of somebody who survived i wanted to come out with a nuclear version of alice like like one where he can't, comes back and he can he can compete he can navigate he can walk you know in in any in any environment no matter how intense or how how you know hot the environment is Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I always say if you if you look at that Nightmare Returns uh, video that was shot, um, it's uh, Halloween night at Joe Lewis Ar Arena, like 20, 30,000 people there. Um, as soon as Alice hits the stage, it's absolutely incredible. He just he just the music is like heavier than any environment he's ever been in. It's all got, you know, and and he's just he's way ahead of the pack. You know, he's pulling us all along in the performance. So day in and day out, I got to see that and I got to learn from that, how Alice was able to communicate to the last role in, in an arena or, or a stadium or a live concert. We played uh, um, Reading Festival and I remember, you know, how many people were there and, you know, Alice just came out and he just controlled the show. It was just it's really it's really a phenomenal thing. So, you know, after that, I was a much better musician. I, I had recorded one album for MCA and then I did the Geffen record, uh, you know, Saints and Sinners. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was in kind of like a great environment. I appeared in a couple of films and, you know, it was it was it was such a different life that I was in, you know, literally three or four years uh, before that. Mm -hmm. So to, when you first met Bob Ezrin in that office in Manhattan and you were taken through to the room and Alice Cooper and Shep Gordon are there, is, is that pretty much the day you started writing with, with Alice? That was it. That was the that day. Was and we were writing for a film that was going to have Def Leppard and, and uh, 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 geez, what was D, what's D Snyder's band? I can't remember it, but, but it was, um, Twisted it, Sister. what is the name of that band? Twisted Sister. Ah, Twisted Sister. Yeah. Uh, he'll, he, he, He'd kill me if he, if he <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, um, you know, and, and by the way, you know, we went, Alice and I went to see D uh, twisted sister play at, at a, at a big venue. And, you know, he, he just, he just ran the, uh, it was, it was just a fantastic show. And then we afterwards, you know, we go into the dressing room and he got, he said, King, I would do anything. 
to fucking write or sing with Alice Cooper. How the fuck did you get this job? <laughs> fuck. You know, he was he was so funny. And and he had Alice and I literally in tears laughing because the, he's one of the funniest motherfuckers that ever watched the fla- planet walk the planet. And and he's also, you know, he's he's brilliant. He's like a very, very smart guy. So, you know, uh and, and you know, that's part of the process. You know, you get to to meet all these people and have you know, their power and their skills that, you know, in some cases they're way past where you are and you get to, you know, sort of learn from it. And slowly, you know, people start dragging you up to their level, that sort of a thing. So, uh, so yeah, no, it, it, it was, it was really, um, you know, I, I think that was the, the sort of the, the beginning of, of me as an artist. And also definitely that meeting was the beginning of Alice and I as a creative team. Mm-hmm. And was that also the start of, of other jobs? I mean, obviously, I know that you, you played some sessions um, for the Rod Stewart album, Every Beat of My Heart. Now, that's obviously, that main theme is actually, Scotland features heavily on that song, actually. But anyway, um, you also played in a, a Berlin album at a point when the uh, same album David Gilmer and Ted Eugene were on. Did that all come from the meeting with Bob Ezrin or was that yes. happened before Alice? Yeah, that all came from Ezrin. I right. mean, yeah, there, there was a... Um, there was a, a moment um, where um, he said, he calls me up and I'm getting ready to go on tour. And he said, I think it was the second tour with Alice. And he said, Hey, uh, Kane, I'm recording. Can you come in and maybe, uh, you know, play a little bit uh, tomorrow? And I said, okay. You know, uh, I said, that'd be fine. And I said, who is it? And he said, Rod Stewart. And I went, Fuck. You know, because as a, as a kid, you know, Rod Stewart and Small Faces and all, all that stuff was like a huge deal for me, you know, yeah. and massive, you know, Jeff Beck and everything. So I figured he's not going to be there. Right. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, whatever. So so I, I went there and uh, Ezrin puts me into the control room and he says, yeah, just tune up and everything. And I said, OK, so I'm tuning up and I look in the recording room, you know, through the glass. You know, that's where you see the drum kit and the microphones and all that stuff's piled all over the place. And, you know, it's usually it's usually a fairly large room. Mm-hmm. And Rod Stewart's in there. And I'm going, Jesus, he's here. I'm going to get to meet him. So, you know, you know, I said I never get nervous. But, you know, that's like a moment where I'm like, oh, whoa, you know. So um, uh, then Ezra comes in. He goes, all right, you're going to do a live blues with Rod. And I was like, seriously, you know, because that is. That's something Jeff Beck has done. That's that's you know what I mean. And th- those guys sort of wrote an incredible history and style of music. So I actually got to play live, uh, singing a blues, and he would sing something, and I would answer him and everything. And, mm-hmm. and you know, and I found out later that you know when I had first walked in, he'd seen me, and he called up, uh, he called up his manager, and he said, "I don't know what the fuck Ezrin's doing." He got Arnold Schwarzenegger to play guitar. <laughs> And I was like, I was like, well, you know, I didn't know that at the time. And when I heard that, I went, ah, oh, geez. But then he, you know, he had me come back, you know, two more times and play. He really liked it. And, and, uh, he had a, an assistant with them and they invited me, uh, to go up and have dinner, you know, like the next week and all that stuff. And, um, you know, I was going on tour, so I couldn't. So that was kind of a horrible thing. I would have loved to have done that. But, uh, um, and I did end up at that house, um, after that, when Alana Stewart and he were, uh, actually, I think they were separating mm-hmm. and she threw one more party there. And, uh, I remember, um, I was hanging out with Alice at chef's house in Beverly Hills. This beautiful, beautiful house, you know, massive pool and all this stuff. And we're, we're in the pool room, just kind of hanging out and Shep walks in around 5 PM and he goes, you want to go to a party? Cause that, that's his voice. It is that low. And we said, okay. So um, we went to that, you know, uh, Rod Stewart's house for the party. And I remember, first of all, we drove up this, you know, two mile driveway. We got in the house and the lobby is like this massive hotel with these statues and, you know, really beautiful house. And as we walked through, you know, we saw the cast from the movie Dynasty Mm -hmm. and they're all dressed, you know, like formal uh jack nicholson walks up to alice and goes hey alice how you doing you know everybody knows alice you know Mm -hmm. and and i'm hanging out you know i'm talking you know with steven seagal and kelly lebrock and kelly lebrock's looking at me shaking my head and i i just looked at her and she goes she goes are you a minder 
And I went, I said, no, no, I play guitar. She goes, why are you so big? Why do you have such big muscles? I said, I have no idea. And I, I look at Steven Seagal and he kind of rolled his eyes like, I don't know. Was, you know, just kind of, I never told anybody those stories, but that's pretty funny. But, but, um, uh, you know, and then, and then, uh, Peter, I, I ended up uh, meeting Peter Wolf um, from the Jay Giles band, who was, you know, really kind of a cool guy. And then Cher walks up and she knows Alice. And, you know, it was just one of those things where I was sort of getting introduced, you know, to Hollywood and just showing the depth of Alice's career. I mean, just everybody knows who he is and had hung out with him at some point. And, you know, that's one of the things, Gareth, if you hang around with Alice, you know how people tell you stories like I'm telling you stories right now. Yeah. Alice's stories, you know, the players are John Lennon and uh, uh, Brian Wilson and Jimi Hendrix. You know, yeah. it's, it's he was right. He was a, the massive part of that whole scene, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, absolutely incredible, lucky experience for me. Well, with, with Constrictor and Raise Your Fist and Yell albums, they do say that, you know, they say you're one of the people who basically helped to relaunch Alice's career again. And as we mentioned earlier on, his shows are, are known for being very theatrical. He totally controls the stage. So was it his idea to give you that rumble light -like persona with rocket shooting guitars, etc., just to, to add to the theatre? No, that, that was, uh, I was at, uh, you know, by that time, Shep uh, had decided to manage me. So right. he was managing Alice and I and, and you know, uh, some other, you know, massive artists. And, and you know, I, I'm not one of the massive ones. And and so, um, you know, uh, they walked in and they said, hey, Kane, I was in some room. And they said, there, there's a kid here with a guitar. He wants to show it to you. And I said, oh, OK. You know, and I hadn't done the first tour yet. So, mm -hmm. you know, I still had a little bit of that deer in the headlights, you know, look in my face, you know. But but so. um he walks in with this, it's, it's this kid named Rick Johnson. And he walks in with this big uh, anvil case. And, you know, he must have been 19, say 20, maybe something like that. Maybe, I, I don't know, somewhere in that range. And he goes, hey, I, you know, I have a guitar. And, you know, I know you're going out with Alice Cooper. I thought, you know, you might want to take a look at it. So I open it up and it's the gun guitar that you see. Uh, on the videos and everything. And, and so I, I looked at, it, I was going, dude, that looks unbelievable. And he goes, he goes, he goes, Oh, thanks. You know? And, and, and so, and I'm thinking to myself, there's no way that this thing plays well. There's no way it sounds good. You know, it, it's just one of those things where you get a guitar that's just completely sort of decked out with special effects and accoutrement, like all this stuff that, you know, has nothing to do with, you know, the action and the sound and the pickups and the bridge and whether or not it stays in tune and all that stuff. So, um, but I was, you know, I was kind of, you know, uh, entertained by all of it. And I said, I said, geez, you know, it, it looks like it shoots and he goes, well, it does. And, and I said, well, I'm not planning on killing anybody at the shows. I don't know what you, and he goes, he goes, no, no, it shoots flame. And he said, you know, let's go out to the parking lot. So, you know, he shows me, I'm holding the guitar and he shows me, he goes, flick this switch when you want it to be active. And I did. And this little red light comes on and he said, now you're, you're ready to shoot it. So, you know, you want to point it up. So I pulled the trigger and it shooting, you know, flame and sparks, you know, maybe 15, 10, 15 feet. And suddenly there's this thing shoots out this other rocket shoots off and goes up in the air explodes and this little guy in a parachute comes floating down and and i was i was going i said dude this is pretty funny i said look at if i use this i don't want the parachute guy okay so so he he so anyway uh i plug it in and i you know i have to tell you gareth it's one of the best playing guitars i've ever owned sounded incredible stayed in tune of course, you know, I made some changes with the pickups and, you know, the action and the, the uh, you know, all the gear on the top of the neck, you know, the tremolo system and all that. But yeah, um, but yeah, so that that's how that started. And, you know, I've mentioned this before, but I made no connection to how I looked with the gun guitar 
to Rambo, <laughs> even though it's absolutely obvious, you know? So, uh, you know, and I remember saying to Alice, like, where, where the fuck are they getting this Rambo stuff? And he goes, have you looked in the mirror? You know, <laughs> so, so it was, it was one of those things. So, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where that happened, you know, and, and as Alice and I built the show, um, you know, he, he allowed me, he and Shep allowed me to be music director. And so what happens, you, you know, you get very involved in, in the special effects and, you know, while Alice is getting his head chopped off or this is happening or, you know, whatever, we have to design sort of the music and the tempo of the music and how it evolves, you know, to, to, to link with what people are seeing on stage. And, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds difficult, but, you know, really, you know, you, you just get into the, into the flow of it, you know, because there's so many talented people that have so, you know, they, they hired people that have done it before and everything. So, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of, you know, the work I did, you know, you know, I did a lot of work on it, but, you know, I was just really lucky just to be surrounded by so many great people, you know, never mind Alice, but, you know, a lot of other people that sort of have been there, done that. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, they, they, I kind of give them most of the credit anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, after the Rage of Fist and Gale album, that was a point that you, you left in the Trash album. I think you, you helped to write one song along with, with Diane Warren, but you technically left Alice Cooper by that point. What what made you leave and pursue other things at that time in your life? Well, I, I think what had happened was uh, we had done two tours. And I I think, you know, once I got the record deal with Geffen, it became a thing where, you know, well, what are you going to do? You know, you, you're going to put your heart and soul and blood and 100 percent and 24 seven into your first or this is my second release. But I think I had finally sort of developed in what I thought would be. And I love the first record. A lot of people do love it. And I do, too. You know, it's got a real raw, uh, uh, you know, quality to it in terms of, you know, who I am, you know, and all that stuff. But, you know, the Geffen record, we, you know, I, I felt a little different. I felt like, you know, I had a lot more chops and, you know, I, I sort of understood a lot more about how everything works. And um, and so what happened was uh, um, I started, you know, I said to myself, what, what am I going to do? So, you know, in, in the by the same token, because Chef's very smart, he realized that that, you know, if 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 my eye is going to be off the ball for even 10 minutes, it might be time, you know, for us to, you know, separate. So mm -hmm. Alice and I talked about it and everything. And it was a mutual thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Alice was uh, staying at my house in Woodland Hills, California, which is, you know, one of the it's right outside of Los Angeles. And uh, I remember I was laying in bed and there was a knock on my door and Alice opens it, <laughs> and he's holding the suitcase in each hand. And he went, I'm leaving you. <laughs> And we started like, you know, like we're breaking up, you know, like that's so what it was pretty funny. But that that was sort of the beginning of like us, you know, going off and doing stuff. But we were laughing about it. And, you know, there wasn't any there were, there were no issues with it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I started going off into a different direction. He was actually writing with Desmond and I was writing with Desmond. And then Desmond brought in Diane Warren. And, you know, when you're writing with people like this later, I wrote with uh, Paul Stanley. He's, he's the same way. Mm -hmm. There are people there are people that, um, you know, they're not all they're prolific and they're they're you know, of course, they, they're they blessed with incredible talent. But the, the point is that when you're there and you're writing, it's such serious business. It's 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 and it's what we were talking about before. If it if you can't if you don't feel that, you know, you've done something great at that moment, you have to fight to get to a great moment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe one of the one of the things about it is like I was still a little bit of a newbie to everything. I was still like, you know, I was still in, in the in a learning process. So, you know, I think Desmond and Diane, because of, you know, what they had accomplished. I mean, there was one point Desmond said that their competition was to see which of them had more songs in the top 10 than the other. And, you know, so that that just shows, you know, they, they're they're sort of the upper they're the elite squad, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of a thing. And so, um, and you know, uh, uh, I, I've said this before, but if you write for 15 minutes with Alice, I mean, with uh, with Desmond, you have a song. Mm -hmm. In other words, I've written with a lot of people. I mean, you know, we're yawning. You want to get a, some lunch, uh, you know, some coffee, you know, what do you want to do? Uh, let's go out. And, and then, you know, might have a verse done at the end of like six hours, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, 
and that's he's you know Desmond's thing is that that's not how the business operates. Like mm-hmm. whenever if you're writing something, it's one of the most critical things you can possibly do. And and so you know what happens is your standard gets gets lifted. You know, and and, and Diane said, you know, I don't really want to work on a song that I don't think has potential to be a hit. So mm-hmm. you know, we, I was lucky to have her you know write with me on on Twisted, uh, you know, from the Saints and Sinners record, which I I thought. You know, was 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 something. I I think that's one of my best efforts. That song, and you know, of mm. course, a couple of the other ones. So, so you just talking about the Saints and Sinners album. So your your soul uh, your soul career started with the self titled Kane Roberts album, and then it continued on to the, the absolutely brilliant Saints and Sinners album. Yep. Um, and then you obviously had the radio and the MTV hit with the Bon Jovi song, the Bon Jovi penned song. Sorry, does anybody really fall in love anymore? Now, who encouraged you? to go into be a solo artist was it was that Shep Gordon again um no I was pursuing that you know he he let me pursue it he of course he helps you know and and what happened was I met uh, Michael Alago now Michael Alago is one of the you know he's uh, you know people more people are becoming aware of him because they just did a documentary on him and he's you know he's he's got a book out and everything but Michael Alago is one of those guys that was, you know, part of the sort of underground cult in terms of, uh, you know, the 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 underbelly of music. You know, uh, he, he was in Manhattan and he, as a young kid, was on the street. You know, he, at 17, he was sneaking in the CBGBs and the Ritz, which he finally became the music director there for a while. Um, he had his 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 hand on the pulse of 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 what was really going on so he signed metallica he's the one who discovered metallica right he discovered white zombie he Mm -hmm. he he discovered flotsam and jetsam he's one of those guys that that you know he's he, he he can see talent and it's only because you know what you would see is uh you know you might be out at two in the morning in manhattan and you see this 18 year old kid running around and, you know, like he was he was everywhere. And it was just because his his absolutely insane, passionate uh, 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 belief and love of 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 the type of music he was into. Um, he, he just that was what he did. In other mm-hmm. words, you know, it, 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 normal people would get up and they do something. Hey, you want to go see a show? You know, well, whatever. And even if they're in the music business, which he wasn't at the time, is even if they're in the music business, um, they don't do it as much as he did. His thing was be, he, he would get up late and he'd get ready to go out and he'd go hunt down bands and performances in the, in the grittiest punk clubs that, mm-hmm. that existed. And when, and when the guy at the Ritz said, you know, why don't you be music director? You know, he, he got, uh, uh, he got the clash there. He got, he got, he got, you know, everybody that you can imagine. He actually, like I played there. I didn't know that he was there, but I played there as, you know, as, as a young guy, you know, uh, whatever. And then he gets, uh, he started, he entered the music industry and that's where he discovered and gave these bands record deals. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, so, you know, he was the one that, that called me up and he said, look, I, you know, I'd really like to, you know, do some, something with you. So he got me signed to, uh, MCA and then he got me signed to, uh, Geffen. Mm-hmm. And I think once he did that, I think that was where, you know, maybe I wasn't going to be you know, Alice guitar, Alice's guitarist, you know, anymore. But the point is that, that he was the one. And of course, you know, Shep is a brilliant guy. He was, I made him aware of everything that was happening and, you know, uh, he became instrumental in, you know, getting Desmond involved and, and, and Diane Warren and, you know, uh, uh, Desmond got, uh, uh, Myron Grumbacher from Pat Benatar's band to play, uh, uh, drums on my my record and of course everything has to go through Shep you know he's one of those guys like you know for me to get Alice uh to be in the video in Vancouver I had to call Shep you mm-hmm. know and you know if Shep didn't think it was going to be a good idea you know it'd be no but you know he he moved heaven and earth for the, for it to happen so you know I'm lucky to have met these people because they're they're just you know he said to me and and this is some of the best advice for artists that are out there trying to trying to make it and these are very special times for any artist to try to to get his music out there and be you know let's quote unquote whatever the genre a rock star mm-hmm. but he said remember in anything you want to do 
it's no until it's yes. And mm-hmm. he said, if, if you quit while it's still no, well, then you quit, mm-hmm. you know. But if you if you keep hammering and learning and fighting, somebody will say yes, and then they won't go away. Mm-hmm. And just so you know, the friend that got me in touch with Alyssa was Michael Alago. Ah. Yeah. Right. So, so, so you, get, you, get, you get, yeah, you get to, you get to learn that, that that's, that's the, that's the Holy grail, you know, mm-hmm. is the people that you meet and the people that believe in you. That's, that's what makes it happen. So why then, when you'd got to that point in your career, when you had all these people around you, you had great contacts, you had people pushing you on further and further, why then, after Saints and Sinners, did you pretty much disappear from the music industry? And were you focused on like, computers, video games, graphics, etc.? What, yeah. what did this change in direction then? When you think well, well okay, weapons? you know, I'll show you. I'll show you two two different people. I'm, I'll make it. I won't make it too long. But I saw the music industry change. I saw a very proactive effort on the terms of MTV uh, to move out my genre of music to get it off the um off the airwaves uh, gr- you know grunge which i think was an incredible music I, I thought nirvana's album was unbelievable i was one of those guys it was very rare you know a lot a lot of my friends went oh what the fuck is this shit the <laughs> fucking album is unbelievable you know so i i thought you know that's fine i thought you know the two types of music could influence each other and still exist but I think MTV, for example, which was kind of the linchpin for everything, uh, became almost politically and proactively involved with with putting rap uh, on their airwaves as opposed to, you know, uh, heavy metal and even grunge, because it, it eventually became kind of a uh, an R&B rap uh, uh, entity after a while. So, mm-hmm. you know, when I saw that happening, I got a sense for some of the politics of it. and And I got a sense that, yeah, you know, there is a cultural trend that shifts in with people. And there was a reason why, you know, grunge was happening. And, you know, and a lot of the lyrics and the bands with, with, you know, eighties bands were like, you know, she's a beautiful woman, but I hate her, you know, as like a evil woman, you know, all that stuff. So I, I, I said, you know what, you know, I, I, what am I going to do? Get tattoos and wear shorts and, and try to, you know, sound like Pantera or something. And it's ridiculous. Those guys own that. That's how they, that's how they evolved. So I just thought, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to step off. And one of the reasons I stepped off, too, is the music business part of it. it it's, it's a little rough. I mean, you know, I, if I ever I do any sort of a seminar or, you know, there's a, a moment where I'm speaking to, you know, artists that are trying to do something, you know, young or old, because, you know, there's never a moment where you should let go of what it is, you know, your ultimate dream. I, I really don't think that. Mm-hmm. But but, uh, you know, I'll say to them. You know, where do we come from? Where does the musician come from? Where does the, the w- w- what is what is the beginning of us? You know, uh, and 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 what was it like? Well, you know, many many moons ago, um, there were we were standing on the side of the road with a mandolin and shoes that curled up with bells on it, and rich people would go by in 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 wagons and throw fruit at us or meat or whatever. You know, that's how we got paid, and it's no different today. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, and I'm talking about the fans, I'm talking about the, the music industry itself, the music, the, the fans, I always feel like that's what I am. That's the person I am, the person I see out in, in the audience. If I ever see some kid and he's raised his fist and he's yelling at me, that sounds like the album cover, but you know, he's like fully into, uh, you know, what I'm doing and you know, whatever he's a, let's say he's a fan of mine. I see myself there that's who mm-hmm. that's that's who i relate to so mm-hmm. so uh so you know it it seemed like you know what I, i'm not going to do this uh, you know be in the music industry or the business for a couple of reasons but one of them was you know i mean my saints and Sinners record came out which i thought was pretty good mm-hmm. and, and it was right when the trending shifted you know and it's funny because you know you're, you're making movies you're doing records on geffen you're with alice cooper you're writing with that i was thinking like hey this is going to be it for 100 years well mm-hmm. you know tastes changed everything moved away some of it was you know proactively uh, put put in place and some of it was just the natural sort of flow i mean the first time you heard uh, van halen well the shelf life begins it's not going to 
it's not going to last forever. That's just the way it is. That's that's how life goes. So so I decided to walk away and do other creative things. Now Kip Winger, you know, he was he was almost the poster boy for you know what was wrong with the '80s. You know, with Beavis and Butthead and all that stuff. And even though his records, you know, the musical underpinnings to them are just stunning. Mm-hmm. There's just so much involved in, in those songs, you know, even she's only 17, his first album, second album, or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. He didn't quit. And yeah. he said to me, he goes, I said, what do you, you know, like a couple of years later, I, you know, two or three, I said, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm, I'm playing uh, at a coffee shop. Uh, you know, if you want to come see me, it'll be in Santa Monica, you know, and, so, and it was like a Borders, which is, a, you know, they sell books and they have a little coffee yeah. shop. He went from playing, you know, stadiums to that. But that's what he is. That's mm-hmm. all he does. And so that's what he kept doing. And he actually brought, you know, the winger uh, franchise, you know, back to a certain extent. And mm-hmm. he does really well. He does really, you know, he plays, uh, you know, venues as, as a solo artist. He's doing his, his classical music. So, you know, in, in an altruistic sense, in a truly sort of uh, committed, passionate sense, his road was that of like an artist in, in, in the music industry, and that's all he does. Mm-hmm. I stepped off, and though I preserved who I am as as a uh, as an artist, but I went off into other things, you know. And one of the best things I did was get into motion graphics and broadcast design, and you know, uh, working on films and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, which I still do today, but. Mm-hmm. You know, I I definitely put, you know, every drop of blood I had at the time into doing the new normal. And and if things had, you know, moved in a more positive direction, I would have started doing live shows again. But, you know, it it, it just didn't. So, you know, which is fine. And now we're in the uh, the world of uh, coronavirus. So, you know, live shows won't be happening for a while anyway. So, no, absolutely. Um, We don't know when they'll come back, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I know. You know, you know, you look at the. artists that were you know playing in front of eighty thousand people vakin you know whatever you know when's that going to be allowed again yeah. so it's 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 a little bit uh, scary but you know these events create new technologies they create new methods of 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 reaching people or whatever so you know ultimately it will turn out for the better um you know and and things will be quote unquote you know great again it's just not going to look the same but you know that's what's what's required. You do have to adjust uh, in life, you know. As 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 each year goes by, you know things change. You never know. And this is like a this is an un, unexpected, out of left field event. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I think you know you're finding that some people are dealing with it properly. So you know, I may be doing a uh, a live broadcast of uh, one of the songs off of New Normal and stuff like that, just to just to give people something. In, mm-hmm. in the face of this kind of odd uh, situation we're in. Mm-hmm. So to, uh, after that, so you've gone away, you've done things for a few years, and then around about 99, you came back with the, the, the Project Phoenix Down, and there's a good few famous names helped you out in that album as well. You did two albums with them, and then, of course, you, you then re-released um, Under a Wild Sky under the name Unsong Radio, or around a, pretty much released it again in 2012. So, yeah. How did you come about getting the Phoenix Down project together? Where did that come from after nine years? And then why did you feel that you wanted to re-release and redo some of these tracks, you know, another 10 or 11 years later again? Well, there, there was, um, there's a guy out there who was the first time I met somebody. Uh, well, not the first time, but he was one of the rare moments where I met somebody where what mattered to him in life was music. And his name's Bruce Mee, uh, M-E-E. He, he, has, uh, he has a magazine, I believe it's called Fireworks. Yeah, that's right. And, and he called me up out of the blue. And he said, hey, Kane, uh, you know. Would you? And, of course, he knew my Saints and Sinners record, you know, backwards and forwards, you know. Like, he, he, he was the one that noticed. Like, like, for me, one of the greatest guitar things I did. It's not necessarily technically one of the most incredible things. But the ride out in the song Rebel Heart, I just started playing. And that's essentially one take. And and in and, and the, the solo slowly builds, you know. And he talked to me about that when he called me on the phone. He said, geez, you know, and at the end, you know, I almost wish they kept the recording going because it sounds like lots of 
fireworks going off and the guitar and everything. I said, yeah, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, and so, I, you know, he and I communicated that way. And he said, I, I'm working with a label called Now and Then Records, and I would love to, uh, you know, do a record with you. So now I hadn't been in that mindset. That was a point where my brain was just not, in, you know, doing that. But I said, so because of who he is, he sort of brought me out of this sort of uh, reclusive kind of a deal that I was in because I never thought I would record again. Mm -hmm. And I did. And, you know, it was a real process for me because I hadn't done it for a while. I was off the grid for a while. And I thought some of the stuff really came out really, really beautiful. I, I really loved what, it, you know, you know, what what the whole thing was. And 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 uh, so, you know, I recorded that one and then somebody wanted me to re-release uh, or put something together that, um, you know, had uh, some some tracks that weren't there before and. You know, so I started, you know, doing, uh, you know, these other uh, uh, recordings and releases. And, you know, to be honest with you, it was my he started my crawl back to where I am now with, uh, you know, uh, the new normal. You know, if it wasn't for Bruce, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have done it. And, you know, it's so funny because he asked me to play fireworks. So I said, you know, and it was a year away. So mm -hmm. I said, OK, I think I can do that. And then he said, I've got a band, you know, and, you know, these guys didn't know me. You know, they didn't care about me. I mean, they're, they're good guys, by the way, but but they didn't, you know, they didn't know anything about me. So I rehearsed maybe twice. So it was it was like the first time in like, you know, I don't know, 15 years I had even like been in front of a microphone. And then I went and did the show and it was kind of a clusterfuck. I mean, I I, I, I what I probably should have done was. 30 rehearsals and like three live shows you know before i went there so it was one of those things and it was like whoa you know so i i told myself i'm never doing that again unless i have like a, a full 100 percent pro band you know to to perform so uh and then the new normal came along and then i was you know getting ready if the record did do well you know to play live but you know the record you know didn't really sell so it was one of those things you know Mm -hmm. Even though I love the record, but what are you going to do? I, I may be wrong, but I, I think Bruce Mee was a Scotsman. I think he was born in Scotland and moved to England. I could be wrong there, though. He what? I think he was a Scotsman. I think he was Scottish. Oh, he is? Yeah. No, he definitely I thought, is. So. Yeah. I thought yeah. so, yeah. But he moved to England, I think, many years ago. And, and it, didn't, it didn't surprise me, you know, because what I said in the beginning of the conversation wasn't just throwaway. You know, because I, like I, you know, when I was in Edinburgh, I do this everywhere, you know, when I was touring is the day off, I leave the hotel and just walk around. And a lot of times I would meet people and go home and have dinner with them, whatever. You know what I mean? Just because, you know, I think I think that's a big part of it. It's it's a little unusual, but I, I it was the way I sort of got comfortable in, in whatever country I was in. Yeah. And the people in Scotland, uh, you know, have a. Uh, an intensity, a, a warmth, uh, you know, and an exuberance or, or like, a, you know, enthusiasm just sounds kind of like a lame word, but they're just freaking over the top about stuff that they love. And, and I got that feeling on stage a, a, as well. So, you know, the fact that he was Scottish, it just seemed like <laughs> this really is I was right. You know what I mean? Because all he gives a shit about is music that, I mean, you know, and, and, and that it's it's viable and it's pure and it's what he likes and what he believes in and stuff like that. I know the new normal record was not what he had expected. So, um, so it was one of those things, but, mm. but, you know, everybody was kind of waiting for me to do, you know, saints and sinners again, which, you know, if I ever get in the mood, I guess I could do something like that. But, mm. but, uh, you know, as long as it's not some sort of business decision, I mean, geez, you know, as a fan, I wouldn't want to think that somebody's writing a song, you know, because of the business underpinnings. I would rather feel like, hey, this is the where the, where the guy is creatively. I'm either going to love it, I'm going to hate it, whatever, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, as an artist, the, the worst thing you want is indifference. Mm -hmm. You want them to hate you or love you. You know what I mean? I think that's where you think, you know, you you, you feel like, well, you're really doing something. You know, when Alice, when Shep discovered Alice. Um, uh, Alice showed me the poster and it says tonight at the, at the uh, whiskey Led Zeppelin and Alice Cooper. Well, no one was there. Nobody knew who they were. 
<laughs> and and so like you know there's like Shep told me he went and there were like 30 people there right mm -hmm. and that led zeppelin played first when alice came out Shep said everybody left he said all that was left was the uh the janitor sweeping up the floor <laughs> and and Shep said if somebody can clear a room like this, he goes, I think they could be a superstar. That's how crazy <laughs> Shep is. So he signed up. And Alice, I think he came out with a hammer and he was just like breaking things. You know, that's all he was doing. Like, you know, singing, you know. And this was before, you know, Bob Ezrin got hold, hold of him. I think he was working with Frank Zappa at the time. All right. And yeah, and Bob Ezrin got hold of him. And, and you know, that's where schools out suddenly became that song i mean the mm -hmm. elements were there with the band and ezrin like sort of like you know knocked it into shape you know that that's how that's how insanely talented he is so, mm. so that that brings us all the way full circle back round to to where we are now then you've just released the new normal I think it's fair to say that all your experiences in the business have led up to this point and the new normal, it, it, it's a great sounding album. And I think you're right what you're saying. It's a modern album, but everything that you've learned up to that point can still be heard on it. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And, you know, one of the things I say, because a lot of people say, you know, to do this, if you listen to the record with headphones, there's, a, there's, a trim, there's another layer there that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to hear without. Mm -hmm. And those are the those are that just shows you, you know, the sort of meticulous nature of, of what the recording process was and and that it was, you know, uh, it, it told like I can hear shades of some of the guitar playing on Saints and Sinners and 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 raise your fist and yell. I can see some of the melodic sensibilities, you know, the environment that it's in, you know, yeah, you know, it's different, but there's still heavy guitar there's still melodic stuff going on a lot. You know, all the choruses have real melody to them. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, uh, and, and, and so, you know, you know, thank you for, for noticing that and, and sort of, you know, justifying it because that, that is the case. Mm -hmm. So what, what's next for Kane Roberts? Do you have plans for new music or do you think you'll step back from music again for a while? I'm just running out the clock. I mean, I, I'm going to be dead soon. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I, I, I think, I think what I'm going to do is um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, going, I've been going in the studio off and on um, and, and see there, there are some businessmen that I met also in, in, in some of the other stuff that I do. And they always say that as business people, and these, these people are extremely wealthy. If the government makes a decision that fucks up whatever you do it, well, you got to step around it. It's just one of life's obstacles. Mm -hmm. So this coronavirus thing and, and, you know, whatever is happening, any sort of political like chaos or, you know, all that stuff. They said, like, y y the point is that you can't get spiritually involved in that because it's, it's not going to it's not going to move you forward. Mm -hmm. It's not going to give you the life that you desire every day. Our real jobs, in my mind, are, are to wake up happy every day. Yeah. So, so if you if you if you stand kind of at the altar of these big events that take place that just seem fully negative, well, you know there are people that are looking at this and saying, you know what, the food delivery uh, 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 business is going to get amped up huge. So I'm going to get involved in that. Mm -hmm. The the broadcast, the Zoom shows or whatever, how, however we're going to deliver music to people, you know, whether they're pay-per-view events with with, you know, one type of genre that, you know, it's just, you know, total heavy metal. And, you know, each band plays like, you know, three songs, you know, whatever it is, you know, whatever the, the new model is, that's what you want to get involved in. That's what you want to look for. Once mm -hmm. the initial shock is done, you go like, you know what? Uh life is what it is right now time this this is whatever this time is well this is my time this mm -hmm. is why i'm here i'm not you know like and so you don't you don't stand at it and stare at it and wait for it to go back the old way i always tell people like you know uh, uh the printing industry for example they used to be like you know you want to get something printed you brought in a piece of paper and the guy set the types and he printed it and blah 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 then somebody comes up with this home printing system it's like 200 bucks you can print something at your house all of those shops closed 
Yeah. You know, and, and the ones that said, OK, you know what, we better get computers in here. Those are the ones that are still around. So so, you know, that that's the thing. In other words, I'm not going to say the coronavirus thing is a positive thing. Mm-hmm. But if it kicks your ass and moves you into a different thing, so you're not just you're not just sitting at the status quo, um, then then in a way you've you've turned something that was potentially negative into a great thing. Everybody, I think, is going to you got to believe that you're going to look back at this a couple of years from now and your life is better. That's the way you have to look at it. So, yeah. Yeah. As you say, it's taking the negatives of the coronavirus, but I do think that a lot of us have changed throughout this. I think we've learned to speak to our families again, to to do things together again, spend more time together. So, you know, there's a new kind of family cohesion in there with a lot of people, I think. Yeah, there's unfortunately been a lot, you know, of poor people have ended up being very lonely throughout this. have not had many people during isolation. But for many, I think it's brought people together. And as you say, it's maybe pushing people on to try new things and look for different ways of doing things. Yeah. You know, one of my models for this uh, um, are my new friends, Doyle and Alyssa, Mm -hmm. because what they what they you know, because I talk to them, you know, and and, you know, we all talk about, oh, you see, what are we going to do and all this stuff? And then it turned into, you know, well, what is it that we miss, Mm -hmm. you know, and and what was important about those things that we miss? Mm -hmm. And I think if if. You know, I, I know for, you know, I went to see uh, Alyssa play and, and I know for her, like if if the audience responds in a, in a great way to her, that that's an, an enriching moment for her. You know, mm-hmm. that's her gratification. So so what's the what's the greatest thing about that is communicating with people. And it's and it's this sort of uh, uh, this flow, this this sort of ebb and flow of, of joy that's going back between the two people. So how do you get that going again? Well, you do a live broadcast or you communicate more on your social networks or you go out and you just do something from some for somebody. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I Doyle sent me like this insane package of all his Doyle stuff, you know, <laughs> like like these shirts with a giant thing in his head. And I wear them once in a while. You know what I mean? Because, you know, there's <laughs> cool shit, you know, and and but, you know, that's him saying, you know, rather than sitting here and being depressed, I'm going to do something for somebody, you know. And, and and that's that's the, that's the point. You know, I, I've been I've been giving people like free lessons and, you know, doing whatever I can on the guitar, you know, stuff like that for people or, mm-hmm. you know, I'm trying to be as helpful as, as I can. And, and I think I think, you know, what's ha- what's being uncovered is maybe not just, oh, geez, I got a show tonight. It's like what's truly valuable about doing that show, because it will come back. Mm-hmm. And and the, the key is, is, you know, what's going to be what we appreciated before. And I think, you know, n- not trying to make this into a positive, you know, hundred percent, cause I, I do understand, you know, the pain and some of the, the, the you know, the, the feeling of, of loss and all that stuff that people have right now. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the shows will, will have, will the, the, the true, you know, engine behind them will be how valuable they are and how, you know, uh, this stuff doesn't have to happen. It can go away. So when we do a show, we have to realize that this moment is a very special moment in time, you mm-hmm. know. So, uh, so yeah, you know, I, I I understand that that it's a it's it's a it's a tough deal. So, um, you know, it just it just requires us all to step out of ourselves a little bit, which you know, not everybody wants to do it. But this was forced, you know. There there was the change came, and we didn't we weren't involved in it, you know. But we have to be, and you know, if we're gonna like make ourselves you know bigger and better people while it's going on. Absolutely, absolutely, you're, you're absolutely correct, the Kane. But just before we finish up, it's been it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been almost an hour and a half, and uh, the time has flown, and it's just been great to speak to you. But before we go, is there anything you'd like to say to the Rock Fiend followers? Yeah, I, I would like to see if anybody can send me some steroids. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I. <laughs> by the way, you know, everybody asked me about that. I, I did them. You know. You can't move to California. If you saw the people I trained with, it was this guy, Bertle Fox. Uh, I trained with Corey Everson. You know, uh, uh, you know, there's people like that. that you, know, you don't know those names, but in bodybuilding, they're massive. You know, and Corey, no, but, but Bertle and some of the guys I trained with were just, you know, giant people. And so, you know, I ended up, you know, taking a little bit, you know, back in those days. You know, I don't do it now, but, but, um, uh, but I, I always thought that was funny. But in, in terms of, you know, what to say uh, 
to to you know the rock fans and everything it's just you know the more you communicate with me like you're the only reason that i record you know the only reason why i would play music and and when i say that i don't mean that as to to sort of ingratiate everybody because i meant it like for me when i looked in the audience i i always saw myself and so so uh yeah so so you know just if if people want to communicate with me and let me know you know what it is you know through instagram my instagram or my facebook and stuff like that um it's stuff that i i always do read their comments and you know whether they're they're tough or whether they're positive you know whatever they are uh and and i do listen to them i do want people to to check out my video you know uh, beginning of the end on youtube and yep. watch for the director's cut but because it is coming i have two more videos coming out that are already uh one of them is already shot and edited and ready to go but I'm going to wait till after beginning of the end. And then the, the second, the third one uh, has this, uh, uh, you know, is, is a very intense kind of a violent, crazy cinematic thing. But there is some, you know, musical performance stuff in it. So I blended it all together. So, uh, yeah, so, so that's it. Yeah. So, you know, just everybody like, you know, communicate me with me, uh, you know, if there's something that you want to see, see or hear and uh, check out my video on YouTube. Absolutely. Check out the video, check out the, the album, and continue to listen to your older stuff too, because it's all good stuff, and I certainly encourage that. Kane, it's been an absolute pleasure. It really has, and thank you so much for your time. Yeah, right back at you. It was a pleasure for me as well, Gareth. <laughs>